You've seen him a lot. Even if you weren't aware, you were looking right at him. For 45 years, Deep Roy has been part of some of the most enduring genre films in the canon. Everybody knows who you are. They just may not know they know who you are. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Mm -hmm. I did Eastbound and Down. I was a Yoda, the prospective Yoda in my young days. The motion picture industry is modeled with exploitative practices towards those whose body types don't conform to traditional norms. But through the course of this essay, I hope to share how Deep Roy has made a broken system work for him. He's built a huge legacy by continually defying expectations. Empty your pockets, you fucking cocksucker! <laughs> Born Mohinder Purba in Nairobi, British, Kenya in 1949, Deep Roy is an Indian raised in Africa by immigrant parents. He was set to study accounting in London, heeding the wishes of his family. So I was a 16 year old kid, went to England studying accountancy. Two years of that, I said, boring. Once he arrived though, he discovered the traditional life was not for him. I said uh, to my dad, uh, hey, I'm, going, I'm going to join the drama school. So I quit after three months, and my dad said, now what? I said, I want to be a comedian. He said, it's a joke. After working out as a stand-up comic on the cabaret stages of early 70s London, he entered the booming television and film market in and around the city. His first few roles were in British TV properties The New Avengers, Blake's Seven, <laughs> and the redoubtable old workhorse Doctor Who. In 1976, Roy entered what he thinks of as his watershed year when he debuted in Blake Edwards' third Clouseau farce, The Pink Panther Strikes Again. That was my first feature ever. What a way to start your movie career with the Peter Sellers, Blake Edwards movie. 45 years ago, show business limited people of his size to a discreet series of character types. In fact, for the next 20 years, he mostly played those roles. Good for a paycheck, but unimaginative in terms of casting. Well, you get frustrated because writers have got a tendency to write for an average person. You have to uh, either develop something for yourself to be tailor-made. Roy had a busy 1980s, often hidden under heavy makeup. He was in Mike Hodges' campy version of Flash Gordon. He was the walking Yoda in Empire Strikes Back. He was in Jedi as Droopy McCool. And he played Teeny Weenie in Wolfgang Peterson's Never Ending Story, among other roles. If being encumbered under a ton of latex or not even being allowed to use his own voice on screen was a problem, he sure didn't make it sound like one. It was hot. <laughs> I was bothered and uh, very limited vision, yeah. but I had a great time. In retrospect, Roy catching all these large film franchises and handling them as work a day has paid off massive dividends since he now occupies a spot next to guys like Ron Perlman, John Reese davies and Bruce Campbell. He's a bona fide genre hero. Deep Roy's career has changed a few times, from second banana to featured performer because he had the vision to treat these once overlooked makeup roles as pure acting. But to work in a costume, it makes you work doubly hard. You know, to make sure it comes into life and the camera picks up. After the turn of the millennium, he cites the series of collaborations with Tim Burton as a turning point in his career. I met uh, Tim Burton in, I think it was 2001. He is an actor's director. He doesn't do that many takes. Tim Burton is a good friend. Not only that, I think he is... Uh, he has got a um, uh, vision. I've worked with Deep Roy a couple of times, and I just find him to be a very compelling looking, interesting person. Deep Roy was cast in two non speaking makeup roles in 2001's Planet of the Apes remake, and then a supporting role in 2003's Big Fish. These efforts led to the one two punch of Corpse Bride and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory in 2005. What an amazing, amazing person to work. I've done four movies with him. The turning point was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Charlie was the most screen time Deep Roy's ever received, and it became the heretofore greatest exhibition of his skill as a character actor. Charlie was the one, was the hardest movie I've ever, ever, ever done. And I had to learn to play drums, to play keyboards, to play guitar, so at least it looks good on the screen. Roy talked the production into changing its plan to have body doubles wear latex masks of his face to fill out the ranks of Oompa Loompas. 
Tim wanted uh, seven people to dance with me to put my mask. I said I'd do it myself. There was only going to be one person cast as an Oompa Loompa, and then every Oompa Loompa would be almost an exact clone of Deep Roy. There would be no women or children, they would just be a tribe of Deep Roys. In effect, he upsold Burton on what he could do for the movie and got himself the biggest payday of his career while snagging over a hundred additional roles all in the same film. You know, that's the toughest movie I've done physically and mentally. Uh, it started with four, four turned out to be seven. Then I did 165 individually. With the spotlight on him in a way it had never been before, he didn't waste his opportunity to put on a show. Deep Roy says that this changed his game, affording him a different relationship with the work. I would take anything that, that is thrown at me, but then again, I don't like uh, people talking about he's, he's a midget, he's a dwarf, and those terminologies. It has to be respectful. His hustle over 30 years culminated in this, being seen by a larger audience than ever before. I do think Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was a needless exercise in studio overreach. However, I've watched it twice now, simply for the amount of fun Deep Roy brings to the screen. It's gratifying to see the performance of one person put a movie over the top, taking something that could safely be considered a big budget slog and turning it into something with actual moments of joy. You're very good. His most recent role in this phase was Aaron in season two of Eastbound and Down, the Danny McBride series on HBO. Roy was given the chance to essay a different kind of role than he usually receives, as well as to employ his comedic chops in creating a wholly vulgar and antisocial character. I'm gonna cut your fucking dick and maybe they'll put a fucking smile on your fucking face. The story of how he got the role is a legend he's rolled out at many a fan panel over the years. They put me on a camera for an audition. I forgot the whole page of dialogue. The guy started laughing at me. He said, just skip the whole page of dialogue. I said, you fucking kid. <laughs> so my agent calls me next day. He says, you got the job. I said, you're fucking kidding me. His ability to slot right into McBride's crass machine looked easy for Roy, as if it had been a muscle he waited years to use. For all the times they dubbed over his voice or covered his face with a mask, this is the inverse of all that. Total personality. I'm from the streets of Bombay. Mexico is the place where the gold is. Well, I haven't seen any fucking gold around here. Follow the yellow brick road. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll find the Ewok village you came from. You got it wrong, buddy. I'm Yoda. Deep Roy is 71 in 2020. So his career has described an impressive arc from his humble start as a young stand-up all the way to his reception on convention floors. He represents an elusive possibility bound within the feature film industry, the potential to dictate your own terms. You know, everything has been good, you know, and then that's, that's how I look at it. Entertainment industry is the greatest business, in my opinion. I salute Roy for his fortitude and gumption, because he certainly did not choose an easy place to make a go of it. He's an avatar of a type of actor who's worked in show business for a long time, perhaps not receiving as much credit as they've earned. All of us fans of genre storytelling have been watching the work of actors of small stature, perhaps being unaware or properly appreciative of their contribution. This is a tribute to the unsung players, the supporting cast members, the makeup actors, the stunt people, the extras, all those who've brought countless worlds alive through sweat and backbreaking toil in a business pocketed with indignity and casual cruelty. It could be effortless to marvel at the dazzling surfaces of what we can see, but let's remember to consider who's on the inside making those surfaces possible. Finest in men's neckwear since 1982.